Okay, welcome back everybody. We are going to start with uh, the respiratory system. So let's see if we can open this up for you. Now, it's an interesting picture here, but when we think about respiration, what comes to mind is something that was probably introduced in anatomy one or earlier on uh, when covering uh, anatomy, when we talk about the cell and the mitochondria, is cellular respiration. So although we have respiration, when we think about respiration, we're thinking about breathing in air and pushing out air, and we're breathing in oxygen and pushing out CO2, and that's exactly what the mitochondria does. It takes in the oxygen and it pushes out CO2. And the reason why it needs the oxygen is if we think about cellular respiration, it's actually called oxidative phosphorylation. So it's oxidizing and phosphorylating, because after all, if we look at what ATP is, it's adenosine tri, adenosine triphosphatase, or um, ATP, adenosine triphosphatate, or adenosine triphosphate. And all it is, is adenosine with one, two, three phosphates. So adenosine monophosphate, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. We need oxygen to do this. We're taking glucose down here at the bottom and we keep oxidizing, we keep breaking down glucose, which is really a six carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, five, six carbon sugar. And the very first step of that takes place over here in the cytoplasm, and it's going to break the six carbon sugar in half, giving us something that looks like this, which is two, three carbon sugars. And that's pyruvate or pyruvic acid, okay? And we need oxygen in order to do that. And then it's going to take these three carbons and it's going to pull off another two and it's going to give us acetyl-CoA, which is really now we're left with two carbons. And every time you break away a carbon from that, they call that beta oxidation, okay? So um, every time you break off carbons, like we break this off and we break this off, we're going to be pushing them out using this carbon dioxide, a carbon latched on to oxygen, CO2. Okay, so when we look at this a little bit closer, then we can see that the initial step of taking glucose, that six carbon sugar, and breaking it down, that's called glycolysis, and it takes place in the cytosol. Okay, right here, there's the mitochondria, and what takes place in the mitochondria is after glucose is broken down by glycolysis, and you're getting from this six carbon sugar, now we get this, this two, three carbon sugars, that's what pyruvate is. And in the presence of oxygen, that pyruvate can enter into the mitochondria, or if oxygen is abs absent, then it turns into another type of sugar called lactic acid or lactate. But in the presence of oxygen, you get acetyl-CoA, that enters the Krebs cycle, and you're making some energy with the Krebs cycle, and then that goes into the electron transport chain where you make lots of ATP. And in order to make energy, the mitochondria need several things. You need B1, you need B2, you need B3. That's for the Krebs cycle. And then the electron transport chain needs iron, and it needs magnesium, and it needs CoQ10. You need CoQ10 for that. So 
if you don't have these things, then the mitochondrial dysfunctions, and they call it mitochondrial dysfunction, and a variety of diseases show up, like from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's to MS. I mean, there's so many different uh, fibromyalgia, things that can show up with these mitochondrial uh, dysfunctions. So this type of fuel or glucose is extremely important because not only is cellular respiration important to produce energy, but the neural system needs three things to function properly. It needs fuel, it needs oxygen, and the neural system needs stimulation or any type of movement. So just having the diaphragm move and contract, right, as the diaphragm moves downward, we take in oxygen and as it relaxes, it pushes up and pushes the air out. So that's movement within itself. So we need movement or stimulation. We need oxygen and fuel. The neural system needs those three things for survival. All right. And as we start to make energy, the exhaust is CO2 and water. Water we can use, the body likes water and CO2 we exhale. All right. When we take a look at different parts of the neural system, uh, the respiratory system, we can see that there's an upper respiratory tract, and then we have a lower respiratory tract. And I would, you know, take some time to pause this and familiarize yourself with, you know, some of the parts up here and some of the parts in here. And then once we get to this part right here, the larynx, now we're at that landmark where we start to get down into the lower respiratory tract okay so again like anatomy and physiology we can uh, divide things into structure and we can divide them functionally so structurally we have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory tract and from a functional standpoint we have the conducting zone and the respiratory zone when we look at the upper respiratory tract that's everything above the larynx and when we're talking about the lower it's everything below the larynx so with the upper we're talking about the nose and we have the nasal cavity the sinuses and the pharynx and the function there is really to filter it's going to warm the air it's going to humidify all the incoming air and it's going to cool and dehumidify the outgoing air when we talk about the lower which is now below the larynx which is the voice box. Uh, you have the larynx, the trachea, which is typically referred to as the windpipe, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. And here we can look at some of these structures again in a different view. Everything from this landmark, here is the larynx, that's the really important landmark, from the larynx down, that's lower, and everything above that is going to be upper respiratory tract. And you've heard of this where people say you have someone has an upper respiratory tract infection or a lower respiratory tract infection. Okay, let's take a look at some of these other important landmarks here. Um, we have the external nares. That's kind of like the, uh, the nostrils on the outside. And then we start to move into the nasal uh, vestibule. And we have these three structures called the nasal concha or concha. And sometimes we'll call this number one, number two, number three. These three structures are also referred to as turbinates. Uh, there's a superior, middle, and inferior turbinate or superior, middle, and inferior concha. And we also have a superior, a middle, and inferior meatus. Those are the spaces between each of the concha and turbinate. And this is really important structure because what they do, if you hear the, the term turbinate, it's like a turbine, it spins the air and centrifuges it as you inhale. And when you do, it spins, warms, humidifies, moistens the air and lets the debris stick, stick to the epithelial uh, mucous membrane. In the back portion of it, we have the nasal cavity. And if there's an external nares, there's going to be an internal nares. At that posterior portion, right over here, is the entrance to the auditory tube. 
and that's sometimes referred to as the Eustachian tube, named after Bartolome Eustachii. And that's going to help equalize the pressure between what we have here and what's inside the ear. Sometimes when you go on high altitudes and atmospheric pressure shifts, you start to want to kind of hold your nose and blow and try and equalize that pressure. Um, in terms of the pharynx, we have three different divisions of it. We have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. If you go all the way posterior to the nose and the back, this region right in here is the nasopharynx. When we follow through the mouth, this region here is now the oropharynx. And then when we find the larynx and we go right back to the back at that region, that area is the laryngopharynx. Then we have this structure here which is elastic cartilage. That elastic cartilage is called the epiglottis. And the whole idea of the epiglottis is as we're eating food, let's see if I can change the color here for a second. As you're eating food and food comes into the mouth and we start swallowing it, this closes downward, right? This flap moves down here, creating a seal closing off the windpipe, right? It closes off the trachea, the windpipe, so that food is now diverted down the posterior pipe, which is the esophagus. One of the things I want you to notice here is that everything blue is cartilage. So the epiglottis right here is cartilage. Then here we have the thyroid cartilage. And below the thyroid cartilage is cricoid. Now, cricoid is here, and it's also here because it's actually creating a ring. It's going all the way around. It's one of the uh, only ligaments, in fact, that makes a full ring going around the windpipe. And cricoid literally means ring. The thyroid does not go all the way around, and neither do these... Um, tracheal cartilages here or these C rings. They really don't go around. They stop. They may go here to here, here to here, but they don't go around the posterior side. It doesn't complete that. And again, <coughs> here's the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx represented by the three different colors. And again, just for a good review, we can see the uh, different turbinates where you have the superior, middle, and inferior turbinate with a superior, middle, and inferior meatus. So the pharynx is the part of the, um, the part of the body that most people refer to as the throat. And it's going to allow for the drainage of the structures of the skull for things to drain through there. It's used to equalize air pressure. Uh, so, as I showed before, in the nasopharynx, it's the Eustachian tube named after Bartolomeo Eustachii. Um, we know that when you yawn, air flows from the oropharynx to the nasopharynx. Sometimes you can hear that little click or that little pop. Um, and for speech, we have the laryngopharynx or the larynx, which is the voice box. So, again, the nasopharynx is where you have the opening for the Eustachian tube or the auditory tube. The oropharynx is used... It's that area uh, of the pharynx in which the mouth will drain into. And the laryngopharynx is your, your voice box. Nasopharynx is an important part of the pharynx. It's the area of the pharynx in which the nose and the ears will drain into. Even the lacrimal glands uh, secrete tears into the eyes from the tear ducts and the, the tears are gonna clean and lubricate and protect the eyes. And the tears are gonna flow from the superior lateral aspect of the eyes down towards the inferior medial part. And it's gonna carry a lot of environmental debris with it. And it's gonna open up into where inside the nose where you have that inferior meatus. And as a result of all that debris moving in, uh, there's going to be a histamine reaction inside the nose where you're going to have swelling of the turbinates and that's where you become very nasal. So again, to review that, up here in the superior lateral aspect of the eye is the lacrimal gland 
and the tears are produced and they start to move from a superior lateral aspect into an inferior medial one and they then start to move in in this direction and it was going to empty right there into the inferior nasal concha where the inferior meatus is and as a result these in here start to swell up as a result of histamine in the ear if we want to review this um, we're going to have the helix of the ear or we have the pina of the ear as well and the oracle and sound waves move in this direction and it's going to sound waves are going to hit this tympanic membrane also known as the eardrum and vibration is going to oscillate it's going to oscillate and vibrate these three small bones in the ear the malus the incus and the stapes or the stapes and that oscillation is going to resonate right in here where you have lots of fluid in the organ of corti and you have these little hairs these small little hairs inside the organ of corti which is deep within the cochlea it looks like a snail right so deep in here we have these hairs that are also going to resonate and vibrate and that vibrational frequency is transferred into the nerve the nerve is called a vestibular cochlear nerve which is cranial nerve number eight there's a vestibular portion for balance and there's the cochlear portion for hearing and you can see how that cranial nerve divides into a vestibular portion right here and a cochlear portion right here and together it makes the vestibular cochlear nerve again these are the semicircular canals there's an anterior canal there's a posterior canal and there's a horizontal canal and that's what deals with a movement of the head when you move your head and you're able to maintain balance it's because these are sending signals to the brain and the brain is then sending signals to your paraspinal muscles to keep you standing erect and balanced if there's a problem here your balance is off okay if there's a problem here then there's going to be hearing issues okay so this just uh, describes what i was just explaining to you you can pause it and you can read it on your own time here's just a blown up version of what i was showing you if you want to take a closer look we can see sound waves coming in here here's the tympanic membrane or eardrum you have the malus the incus and then you have the stapes, stapes those are the three smallest bones in the body and then those are the canals also fluid is traveling through here if you ever wonder where vertigo comes from it comes from an issue here and then here's the cochlea the snail the shell and the organ of corti is inside here which is for your hearing and you have these little hairs that get stimulated with the vibration through there here is the auditory tube all right so to give you an idea the in that nasopharynx where you have the uh, eustachian tube we have the balancing of pressure between what's in here and what's in here and that's where you get the clicking or the popping based on you know holding your nose and pushing and altering the pressure of what happens to the membrane of the ear we've heard of um, otitis media or ear infections um, common in young kids uh, but uh, the overuse of antibiotics is has really been abused for this most of these do uh, most of them are mechanical and um, with the right knowledge can be fixed within just you know just a few days um, I've seen this happen numerous times with all three of my children uh, where they've never needed antibiotics for ear infections we've always done manipulation or adjustments of the ear and the upper cervical spine and within hours to a day or two they self-resolve um, so mechanically or biomechanically speaking the auditory tubes of babies and children they're more horizontal and they're also narrower compared to that of an adult okay so just keeping that fluid in there moving is key also the problem with young babies is drinking you know drinking a baby bottle in a supine position oftentimes that bacteria can get lodged from the mouth it can go up through the oropharynx 
um, into the eustachian tube. And that becomes a problem. So keeping the baby more vertical and upright when drinking a, a bottle um, is key. And getting the right type of bottle where the bottle gets tilted, not the baby. Okay. Otherwise, you get uh, bacterial overgrowth in there. And also exposure to toxins. You know, there's a higher incidence of um, uh, not just allergies, but also otitis media in children that are raised in homes and where smoking takes place in the house. Dairy is also known to uh, be a trigger for otitis media. Um, forced hot air systems where the heat dries out the mucous membranes, that's also uh, an issue, and many nutritional deficiencies, anything that deprives the uh, immune system of its strength can certainly create, create it. Zinc being one and vitamin D deficiencies being another. Um, there are uh, some viral and bacterial um, infections that can that are uh, causing ear infections and the symptoms are really fluid fluid buildup uh, in the middle or behind the eardrum where the child has pain and the eardrum is red but this can be really uh, monitored on a hourly basis and daily basis just from an otoscope going inside the ear looking at the color of the eardrum if it goes from white to pink to red, it's getting worse. If it's getting red and the next day it's pink, it's already improving. And then less pink to pearly white, it's already healed up. Uh, there are also bacterial issues. So if it's a viral issue, an antibiotic is silly. It's not going to have any effect. And bacteria, infections, these usually take uh, care of itself within a few days. It's if we start to see pus that's building up or pain behind the ear when pushing along the occiput uh, where the mastoid process is. If that's painful, that could be an issue. That's where the ear infection has uh, progressed in a more negative direction. So careful monitoring is also key. Uh, my son's pediatrician who is in Garden City, um, he's been in practice, uh, gosh, over 20 years and he likes to send the infants and babies to a local uh, doctor of chiropractic within his area. And the doctor is trained to treat children and infants, and they treat it from a biomechanical perspective first. And then he checks the baby in three to four days later, if at which point the eardrum has gone from pink to red, then they start moving forward to antibiotics when it goes from red to pink, then obviously they're already improving to pearly white and no other action is needed. Um, adjustments to the atlas really give quite a boost, boost to the immune system, and it increases the naturally produced serum thiol levels, which are antioxidants, gives an incredible boost to the immune system, plus lymphatic drainage to the neck and manipulation of the ear to get the fluid moving uh, seems to do the trick. According to our pediatrician, he said nine out of 10 cases uh, self-heal. That one instance is the one that really needs some antibiotic assistance because the parents have overused and abused antibiotics from birth. Um, it's difficult for their own immune system to kick in and engage and work on its own. Here's a pearly white membrane. Here's one that you can see is very red and infected. Here's one that has some fluid and here's a ruptured uh, membrane. So the complications, the middle ear should normally contain air and when fluid exists within the middle ear that the panic membrane is unable to oscillate and vibrate back and forth to pump the fluid inside the cochlear apparatus effectively. Now if that occurs it can result in permanent hearing and speech disorder and the mastoid bones right right behind the ear, you remember the mastoid process of the skull contains these mastoid air cells and they help the middle ear in regulating pressure and volume of air that it contains. And occasionally a middle ear infection may spread into the mastoid air cells that help the middle ear regulate the pressure and the volume of air that it has. And that middle ear infection can spread into the mastoid air cells causing a condition that's very painful called mastoiditis. So whenever my kids had, um, if I saw them tugging on the ear, I'd always go and push behind the ear in the mastoid and never was it red, hot, or inflamed. 
And keep in mind with babies and infants, as they're teething, they often tug on the ear and the ear can get a little bit irritated. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's an infection. Really important picture right here. And so we know that here's the nose. And then in this box that we see right here, this is the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve number one. And there are these cranial uh, olfactory bulbs that penetrate right through that bone. Now that bone is the ethmoid bone. And that's the only thing that's separating the outside world here from your inside world, which is here, is this thin bone. But the connection are these cranial nerves. So this is why it's important to, to really wash your hands well so that you don't get bacterial overgrowth in this mucous membrane of the epithelium that spreads upward into the brain. Now, I'm not saying wash your hands with antibacterial soaps and using antibacterial wipes and antibacterial sprays. I actually think those things are much more harmful. A lot of research and peer-reviewed evidence research is supporting uh, that perspective. So my opinion and my opinions are really based on uh, peer-reviewed evidence that I've been reading through the years. And this evidence has been progressing and moving in this direction for the last 20 to 25 years that we learn to, we need to learn to live with bacteria and viruses and not always try and kill them as if they are the enemy. Um, if they are within us and we die, then they die with us and they don't want to die. They want to learn to live symbiotically with us, okay? So keep that in mind. Cleaning the hands are very important. Regular soap and water, I believe, is all that's necessary. Um, if someone has a weakened immune system because they were brought up on uh, antibiotics, then that is a unique situation where those people do need to use a little bit more of antibacterial wipes and sponges and sprays because they've never given an opportunity for their body to fend and fight for itself. So those are the people that need these external assistance. But if you start building up your own immune system and exposing yourself to these things naturally, the immune system loves to be challenged that way and build up its strength. Many times when you experience a stuffy nose, it's not because the nasal passages are clogged with mucus or infections, but they become swollen. Now the nasal membranes respond to histamine, which is secreted by mast cells. Mast cells are a type of white blood cell that responds during inflammation. And we know people take antihistamines, which are prescribed to reduce the swelling of these nasal passages. But what we're starting to see is a trend with hypoactive thyroids as a result of using these antihistamines. Because when you use an antihistamine, it actually blocks the same type of histamine receptor, which is the H1 receptor, in which uh, is used to stimulate the hypothalamus. So histamine one stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases thyroid releasing hormone. Thyroid releasing hormone goes to the pituitary. Pituitary releases thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone goes to the thyroid to push out T4, which is thyroxin. Thyroxin goes to the liver in which T4 is converted to T3 triiodothyronine, which is needed to speed up your metabolism. So we're starting to see people develop these hypoactive thyroids as a result of using these uh, anti-allergy medications during the summer when they have, or spring, when they have uh, these increased sensitivities and they're using antihistamines like Allegra and they're using uh, Benadryl and things of that nature. Let's look at some of the sinuses. There's the frontal sinus, phenoid sinus, maxillary, and ethmoid. So here, you can see it both from the sagittal perspective and anterior to posterior. So we have the sphenoid sinus. You can see where those are. The ethmoid. And again, that's where the olfactory nerve is going to penetrate through. Here's your frontal sinus. We know many people get these frontal sinus headaches and sinus build up and pressure above the eyes. And then there's the maxillary right here. The mastoid air cells would be right back in here where the mastoid bone is. 
The function is to cleanse the air, moisten the air. It acts as a, a pressure or volume reserve, and it's needed for, for speech. Here's another great picture showing the cribiform plate or the ethmoid bone, which is right there. And again, here's the olfactory epithelium in the nose. You've got mucus that's sticking to it. And then you have whatever that odorant is, whatever you're breathing or inhaling in sticks to the mucus. Now it hits the olfactory receptor cell and it's gonna convert that into a frequency in which the olfactory nerve for cranial nerve number one is gonna send that back into the limbic system, right? The sense of smell is the only sense that doesn't hit the thalamus. The thalamus is part of the uh, diencephalon. We have the hypothalamus, thalamus, the epithalamus. Um, the, the smell is the only sense that doesn't go directly to the thalamus. All the other sensory input synapses there first before hitting that post-central gyrus. Okay, so the respiration is going to be the exchange of uh, gases between the atmosphere, your blood, and your cells, right? You have air and oxygen outside of you. When you breathe it in, you're going to take it in to the blood. The red blood cells carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin binds to gases, whether they are oxygen, nitrogen, or carbon uh, dioxide, and it's going to find a way of bringing that oxygen or CO2 to and from the cells. So the combination of these three processes is going to require uh, ventilation, breathing, external respiration, which is called pulmonary respiration, and then internal respiration to the tissues. So the cardiovascular system is assisting in, uh, it, it assists the respiratory system for transporting the gases. Let's see if we can activate this. If I can't from here, then uh, you should be able to uh, open this up uh, on your own time. But let's see if I can click on this because I am, there we go. Let's see if this opens up. There we go. The respiratory system is responsible for the movement of gases involved in cellular metabolism. Oxygen is used up and carbon dioxide is generated during the aerobic breakdown of glucose and other fuel molecules in order to produce ATP. Three important continuous physiological processes are responsible for the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Ventilation moves gases in and out of the lungs. Gas exchange is the movement of gases into and out of the blood. Gas exchange occurs at the lungs and is called external respiration, and at the tissues, which is called internal respiration. Blood gases are transported throughout the body via the bloodstream. The pulmonary circulation transports the blood gases to the lungs, while the systemic circulation carries them to the organs and tissues throughout the body. The process of bringing air into and out of the lungs is called ventilation. There are two phases of ventilation, inspiration, also referred to as inhalation, where the air is brought into the lungs through the airways, and expiration, also referred to as exhalation, where the air is moved out of the lungs. Proper ventilation is important to promote airflow, which enhances gas exchange. The movement of air is driven by pressure. A gas cylinder with a pressure gauge clearly illustrates the relationship between volume and pressure. Air will naturally flow from regions of high pressure to regions of low pressure. Pressure can be altered by changing the volume of the compartment. Since air pressure provides the force for airflow, changing the relative pressure within the compartments 
can control the direction of airflow between compartments. Because pressure and volume are inversely related, pressure in a closed compartment can be changed by altering the volume of the compartment. When volume is reduced, pressure increases. Conversely, when volume is increased, pressure drops. Prior to normal inspiration, atmospheric and alveolar pressures are equal. During inspiration, contraction of the dome-shaped diaphragm causes it to flatten, increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity by increasing length. Additionally, contractions of the external intercostal muscles elevate the ribs and increase the volume of the thoracic cavity by increasing width. The lungs and visceral pleura are pulled outward and lung volume increases. Alveolar pressure drops because of the increase in lung volume. When alveolar pressure drops below atmospheric pressure, air moves into the lungs. Prior to normal expiration, atmospheric and alveolar pressures are equal. Normal expiration is a passive event and does not involve muscular activity. Reduction in lung volume is achieved primarily through the elastic recoil of the lungs, which were stretched during inspiration. Alveolar pressure increases because of the decrease in lung volume. When alveolar pressure rises above atmospheric pressure, air moves out of the lungs. Okay, great. Let's continue on with the PowerPoint now. Let's get back to where we left off. Okay, let's take a look at this one. See if it's any different. I think it is. Yep. Okay. Well, let's just take a look. Let's click on some of these structures here. So these are some of the respiratory organs here. We're looking at the lung and the thoracic cavity. Now the conducting portion, here's the nasal cavity. There's the pharynx. Move down lower, larynx trachea, left and right primary bronchi, bronchioles, and now we move down, here's the alveoli. Here's the nasal cavity, here are the sinuses, nose, there's the epithelium, nasal cavity, external nares, internal nares, olfactory epithelium, and there's the meatus. Here's the pharyngeal tonsil, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, there's the elastic cartilage called the epiglottis, hyoid bone, only bone in the body that doesn't articulate with any other bone. There's your voice box, the larynx that has the true and false vocal folds, and respiratory epithelium, esophagus, which is the posterior pipe, anterior piping is the trachea. Here's the larynx, there's your hyoid bone, epiglottis, false vocal folds, true vocal folds, thyroid cartilage, retinoid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, the only one that goes all the way around, and then the tracheal rings. So the larynx is up here. And in the front is the laryngeal prominence. That's what actually creates the Adam's apple. Here's the trachea. There's the primary bronchi. There's a left 
uh, primary bronchus and a left primary bronchus. Then we go to the secondary. There's a right secondary and left secondary bronchus. Uh, bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular. And it's the secondary uh, bronchi that actually enter the different lobes of the lung. So the right lung has three lobes. The left lung has two lobes. These are tertiary. There's the lung. Then we have these very small bronchioles and the diaphragm is here. When the diaphragm moves downward, we inhale. When the diaphragm pushes upward, we exhale. Trachea, primary, bronchi, secondary. Okay, these are the same structures I had already shown you. Let's go back. Let's look at the bronchioles. So here's the respiratory bronchioles. These are venules, arterioles, and capillary system. So this is where that gas exchange is going to take place. The exchange of oxygen and CO2 is going to take place here. There's your terminal bronchial. There's smooth muscle. So this constricts or dilates. There's the alveolar ducts, alveoli, and the alveolar sacs. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so again, there's our meatus or turbinate, superior, middle, and inferior. And there's the nasal, I'm, I'm sorry, so let, let me just go back. Here's the nasal concha, also known as, I'll put a T here for turbinates. There's a superior, turbinate, middle, and inferior. And then between all of them are the valleys or the spaces called the meatuses, superior, middle, and inferior meatus. Here's the sphenoidal sinus back here. Here's your frontal sinus. Here's your tongue. Look at the tongue, how much of the oropharynx that takes place. Here is the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngeopharynx. Esophagus is in the back, trachea is in the front. And then here's the olfactory epithelium. Uh, just another view up on top showing the uh, concha and the meatus, and then uh, down below you could see some of the sinuses as well. This structure right here, just want to point out the vomer, the nasal septum right here in the middle. That's where you hear people saying, oh, I have a deviated septum and they have some sinus issues. There's the perpendicular plate that's there and the vomer makes up part of it as well. So the vomer is the visible part on bone when you look inside the nose and as you move up higher, you get that perpendicular plate. And then a little bit higher, there's a little protuberance that would come right through the bone up on top that you would see, called a Christogala. Some obvious anatomy where you have uh, the root at number one, apex at two, bridge and external nares. Okay, let's go through some anatomy here. Here's the epiglottis. There's your hyoid bone. Let's get our orientation, right? So here's anterior on the left. Here's posterior on the right. That's important. Um, so you can see that the thyroid cartilage which is here, pretty large in the front, really large there. Here's the Adam's apple. There's that protuberance right there. And you'll see that it doesn't form a ring on the posterior side like the cricoid cartilage does. The cricoid cartilage we can see here, it's in the front, and it also wraps around on the posterior side 
unlike here, where we have these tracheal cartilages. They don't form a full ring because you could see here, it's opened up. Okay, the arytenoid cartilage, which is here, and the corniculate cartilage here, you'll see that these actually rotate and move and they change the orientation of the true vocal folds. Those true vocal folds are gonna go like this and like this, and depending on how these rotate inward or outward, it changes the tension on those strings. Think of them as like guitar strings. And the more tense they are, the higher the pitch. The more relaxed they are, the lower the pitch. And here, on the lateral perspective here, we can see the vestibular fold here. And we can see the vocal fold. The vocal fold is the true, and this one here is the false vocal fold. There's your epiglottis. So the true vocal folds, they consist of the skeletal muscle and mucous membranes, and they're the ones really responsible for producing sound. The false vocal folds are really there to regulate and direct the airflow, and they stabilize and support the true vocal folds. And I like this illustration because it shows on the top, on the left, you can see where the true vocal folds, they're closed, and then on the right, you can see how the arytenoid cartilage and corniculate cartilage kind of rotate out and opens up, allowing for increased airflow, and it starts to change the pitch of someone's voice. And you can see the same thing happening down below. Same thing here. You can see on the left-hand side, the top and bottom, how you get the vocal folds that change from being spread apart to being very close together. And on the right-hand side, you can see how the glottis is open and the, how the glottis closes as well. So only the true vocal folds actually produce the sound. The false vocal folds exist along the sides of the true vocal folds and they help direct the air exhale during speech through the opening between the true and the false, false uh, the true uh, vocal folds during speech, the true vocal folds are brought together by muscles. As speech begins, the air is exhaled against the closed vocal folds. When air exhaled, the air separates through the true vocal cords are brought together by muscles. And as speech begins, air is exhaled against the closed vocal folds. When the exhaled air separates the true vocal folds, they begin to vibrate and they create the sound of your voice. The volume and the pitch of the voice can be altered by the varying degree of contraction of the muscles. So the faster that they vibrate and bang against each other, uh, the higher the pitch, and then the slower that they vibrate, then the lower the pitch. If the muscles controlling the closure of the true vocal folds contract forcefully, their tension on the true vocal folds increase, and the pressure of the exhaled air must be increased in order to separate the true vocal folds and initiate those vibrations required to make the sound. And the vocal folds will vibrate rapidly, creating the voice sound with a very, very high pitch. Also, the sympathetics being engaged uh, increase the tension, increase the pitch. When your parasympathetics are engaged, like first thing in the morning, your voice may sound a little bit deeper. Also, hormones can affect um, the voice. So testosterone thickens those muscles, just like testosterone thickens other skeletal muscle, making the pitch a little bit lower. Okay. Uh, let's just see. Cancer of the throat. Remember, cancer is any type there is abnormal growth of the epithelial lining. Um, you can see a white patch in the mouth called leukoplakia, commonly caused by smoking. Um, there's usually chronic hoarseness or that roughness of the voice, a chronic cough. There could be the sense of fullness in the throat, like a lump. And hemoptysis, which means when someone coughs, they're actually coughing up blood. And then there's dysplasia, which means the difficulty in swallowing. Here is growth, uh, cancer of the larynx. You could see this tumor or this growth growing inwards right here. 
that's going to obstruct uh, anything traveling through that that uh, airway. Um, wanted to point out here how you can see we have the windpipe here, the trachea, and the esophagus. This is anterior. Back here is posterior. You know the esophagus is posterior, and here is the tracheallus muscle. Okay, here's the tracheallus muscle. So if we're swallowing food, large chunks of food, this can expand if need be and can move inward in this direction, even close off some of the, the airway. Um, should be a little bit familiar with the flow of air, how we have the trachea, then it moves to the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, and then the tertiary bronchi. They would move into the bronchioles and into the terminal bronchioles. There is this carina, which is the split right here. This is where your cough reflex is. So if you inhale something that moves downward and that irritant hits here, <coughs> you cough and it tries to push it back out before it hits the deepest part of the lungs. All right, so here's the larynx. There's your hyoid bone up on top. There's your trachea. And here is your primary bronchi and then secondary bronchi. Right and left together are bronchi. When you're talking about one, this one here would be the right primary bronchus. Usually the right primary bronchus is shorter and wider in diameter. So if a child is going to inhale something, most um, obstructions are going to take place in the right primary bronchus. Okay, we spoke about the tracheallus muscle. You can pause here and read up on that if you'd like. This picture here is really just showing what I went over before, how here is the esophagus, and then there's the tracheallus muscle. Here's the lumen of the trachea. That's your windpipe. If you didn't have this, it would be difficult because if you're swallowing large chunks of food and you have cartilage going back here instead of muscle, that would be hard, right? I mean, there wouldn't be much room for expansion of the esophagus and that tracheallus muscle allows for some additional give in the esophagus should we need it. In the larynx, um, there is pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium pseudo-stratified. It's not really stratified, but it looks stratified because the nuclei are scattered at many layers, right? Here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus, and because it looks like they're at one, two, three, four different layers, you could think that they're stratified, but they're really not. Here are the cilia. These are goblet cells that produce mucus, and here's the lumen. So when there's irritants or smoke that's coming in, smokers really damage and paralyze all of these cilia here. And when they become paralyzed or damaged, they're going to die off and they're going to be replaced by squamous cells. And that's what we call metaplasia. So those cilia are designed to be rhythmically upward. And when they become paralyzed, you get all this debris getting deeper and deeper into the part of the lungs and when the person wakes up in the morning they have this smoker's cough because the cilia were paralyzed they weren't beating to push up any debris that it trapped and whenever you have you know one tissue type being replaced by another we call that metaplasia which is typically precancerous and when you have that pseudo stratified ciliated epithelial columnar being replaced by squamous cells um, that is uh, precancerous and can cause squamous cell carcinoma, which is a deadly form of lung cancer. So you may want to pause this and, and read this on your own time again. There's the cilia. Uh, the bronchi, these are branches um, off of the, the trachea. The trachea is going to bifurcate after the carina into a left and primary bronchus. The, primary, the right primary bronchus is shorter and wider and it's oriented more vertically than the left, so that's why you get more aspiration uh, injuries to the right side than the left.
Okay, these, this again is just another picture of the bronchial tree. And they have different names, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, sometimes they call it trachea, the main bronchus, lobar, segmental. Okay, that would be like primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, bronchi. The terminal bronchioles are at the end of the conduct conducting zone. So after the conducting zone, remember, is the respiratory bronchioles. We have the respiratory zone in there. So again, you got the trachea, the main bronchi, the lobar, and then you got the terminal bronchioles. Now we move into the respiratory zone. We have the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveolar sacs, which is where the gas exchange is going to take place. The primary bronchus, the branch, which is going to form the secondary bronchus. And uh, there's going to be one uh, primary bronchus, one left and one right primary. The secondaries, now the right is going to have three, the left is going to have two, because remember the secondaries are going to branch right into the lobes. There are three lobes of the lungs on the right side, a superior, middle, and inferior lobe and only a superior and inferior lobe on the left-hand side. The tertiary bronchi, also known as segmental bronchi, those divide into bronchioles. Now, each one forms about 6,500 uh, terminal bronchioles. That's gonna supply air to a single segment of the lung tissue called the bronchopulmonary segment. The terminal bronchioles, that's the last part of the conducting pathway. That's gonna supply the pulmonary lobules. The respiratory bronchioles, that's the first segment of the respiratory zone. So if you want to go back and you go here, there's the respiratory zone, right? You got those respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs again. Remember the terminal bronchial right here? That's the end of the conducting zone. And now the respiratory bronchioles begin the respiratory zone. Respiratory bronchioles, that's where the gas exchange takes place. We have the alveoli and the alveolar ducts. There's the flow again. Trachea, primary bronchi, secondary, tertiary to bronchioles, to the terminal bronchioles. Now you end the conducting zone and we start the respiratory zone. We have the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, sacs to the alveoli. Here's another visual of that where you have the terminal bronchioles. So right here, right there, that's the end of the conducting zone. Everything up here was conducting zone. Everything down here is now the respiratory zone. And here's another close-up view. I'm just gonna pause it here so you can take a look. You can see the terminal bronchial up on the top left here. So this is the end of the conducting zone. And right here, that's the beginning of the respiratory. Here's the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs. This is where all the gas exchange is taking place. You can see the capillary beds here for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So that's where you're going to learn about the alveolar 1 and alveolar type 2 cells. And the alveolar 1 or septal cell number 1, that's the one that's primarily involved in gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. And alveolar 2 or septal cell 2, this is the one involved in secreting surfactant. And surfactant is needed to decrease surface tension within the alveoli so they don't stick to each other. We want those to kind of contract and expand as well. We don't want them to stick. This is made somewhere around like week 34, 35, 36 embryologically. And that's a big problem with babies that are born premature. They always kind of assess the respiratory rate and rhythm and make sure that there's no respiratory issues when they do an APGAR scoring when a baby is born. Uh, asthma, simple, just look on the right-hand side, you see how open and dilated uh, 
the airway is here and then how restricted and inflamed it is here. So in an asthmatic person, the muscles of the bronchial tubes, they're tightened and they're thickened. They become flamed and filled with mucus and it's difficult to move air uh, through that. This sometimes happens also with asthma. Uh, there's something called athletically induced asthma, where if you think of it, the people have asthma attacks only when they're exercising, which means it's only at a time where the mitochondria is not producing enough energy. So if the mitochondria is not producing enough energy, there's going to be dysfunction. So that's where you look at magnesium and CoQ10 and iron and B1, B2, B3. So there's some sort of antigen that's presented into the airway, all right? And then these mast cells degranulate and they're going to release histamine and a whole bunch of other inflammatory mediators. So here's the lumen, right? Here's the airway right here. These are the epithelial cells. You can see the cilia there. There's goblet cells that are producing mucus. These are dendritic cells. They are producing the antigen right? They're antigen presenting cells. So they're going to bring the antigen. And here's a mast cell that's producing all of these mediators. They're going to secrete mucus and it's going to restrict the airway. So you have all of this accumulation that's taking place and it blocks the airflow. You can also see you have neutrophils, which are responding. Eosinophils are always responding to allergies. So uh, and uh, bronchitis is now an inflammatory condition of the bronchi characterized by swelling and redness or erythema of the mucous membranes that line the internal surface of the bronchial tubes. And bronchitis can be caused by bacterial or viruses and even uh, smoking. It has the same type of symptoms um, as asthma. It's difficult, difficulty in, in breathing. You have that same presentation within the bronchi where it's inflamed there. Uh, difficulty in breathing, that's what dyspnea is. When there's apnea, there's no breathing. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Eupnea is just normal breathing. Uh, there's often chest pain or back pain. There's a productive or non-productive cough. With bronchitis, there's wheezing and typically a fever. With asthma, there's no fever. With bronchitis, there is fever. Usually the body takes care of it within seven to 10 days. If not, that's where antibiotics come into play. Um, let's show you the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, the differences. I think a visual does the trick. Here's the visceral pleura, and here's the parietal pleura. The visceral pleura, closer to the viscera, to the lungs itself. The parietal pleura is the outermost covering. Pneumonia is an acute infection of the lung, tissue, or bronchi. Typically, pneumonia is found with people with suppressed or weakened immune systems. So we often hear that when people are uh, ill and they're in the hospital, the last stage is pneumonia. It's not that pneumonia is what killed the individual, it's typically the weakened immune system made them vulnerable to any type of infection, pneumonia being pretty common. The symptoms are fever and chest pain and back pain. There's the Rails, which you can hear with the stethoscope, which is the crackling sounds heard through the stethoscope during breathing. That's when your doctor takes the stethoscope and says, breathe in, breathe out. They're listening for these type of rails. And often they're exhausted and very tired. And again, they can have a productive or non-productive cough. Typically with pneumonia, there's a very low grade fever in the beginning and then it can, it can spike. But in the beginning, usually very tired and a low grade fever and and when people are walking around with it, they'll say, oh, they have walking pneumonia. Again, you'll see here that the causes of that are typically um, lowered resistance. Okay. COPD. Here's an interesting term. And often you'll hear of a C-O-L-D. Cold. Oh, I have a cold, don't get too close to me, right? 
chronic obstructive lung disease. Unless you have bronchitis or emphysema, you do not have a cold. So be careful using the terminology. That's what the COPD is. The P for pulmonary is the exact same thing as the L for lungs. So just because you have the sniffles doesn't mean you have a cold. Power to words, be careful what you're saying. Chronic bronchitis and emphysema are COPDs, chronic obstructive lung disease. Bronchitis, we already went over. It's when the internal surface of the bronchi are red, swollen, and inflamed. There's reduced diameter of the airway, creating dyspnea, which is difficulty in breathing or wheezing. Can be caused by bacteria or viruses and allergies and smoke. Uh, bronchitis is treated typically traditionally with uh, antibiotics or prednisone, which is a steroid to open up uh, the airway. Emphysema, this is typically what affects people secondary to smoking. It is a disorder of the lungs characterized by a breakdown of the elastic tissue in the lungs and a chronic hyperinflation of lungs. When you have a hyperinflation of the lungs and someone percusses on the lungs, when they take a finger and they tap on it, it sounds hyper resonant. Typically, they have this barrel chest, this large, thick, muscular chest as well. Now, the causes, the tissue to lungs produce an enzyme known as elastase. Anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Now, elastase is an enzyme that breaks down the old elastic tissue in the lungs and allows new elastic tissue to be produced in its place. Remember, the body takes old things, breaks them down, and builds up new. Old skin cells slough off, you make new. Old hair cells slough off, you make new. The new elastic tissue, which is produced by the cells of the lungs, allow the lungs to maintain their natural elasticity. Now, another enzyme known as anti-elastase is produced by the tissue of the lungs, which inhibits the breakdown of the elastic tissue in the lungs by inhibiting the function of elastase. Now, some of the chemicals that are in tobacco smoke inhibit the function of anti-elastase. And when anti-elastase is not inhibited, the result is an increase in the activity of the enzyme elastase, which breaks down the elastic tissue. When that occurs and the elastic tissue of the lung is destroyed, now you have decreased ability of the lungs to function the way they should. As a result of the destruction of the elastic tissue in the lung, the compliance or the effort that's required to inflate the lung against the resistance of the lungs and the tissues of the thorax of the lungs increases which ultimately results in a hyperinflated lung as a reduced ability to exhale, which is, character, which is the characteristics of emphysema. So they get this barrel chest, this hyper-resonance that takes place, labored breathing. You get the increase of the muscles in the neck and the chest because those respiratory muscles are working hard to try and get whatever air came in out. Prednisone or steroids, or typically the therapy, and quitting smoking is a therapy. Here's what a normal chest looks like on the left-hand side. There's the barrel chest on the right-hand side. Major, major difference. Increased in all of the secondary uh, accessory respiratory muscles there. Also with lung pathology, you'll see something called clubbing of the nails, and that will look like this is early to normal, but as you start to see this thickening and this increase over here, the thickening around the skin, and this really starts to thicken and bow downward, that's clubbing. That's seen with, deep, with hypoxia, decreased oxygen, lung cancer, uh, any type that's decreased oxygen, that's hy hypoxia. Also, this should be pink. When we start to see the nail bed white, those are seen with anemia and decreased oxygen. Um, mesothelial cells help to make up the serous membrane of the pleura, and mesotheliomas can either be benign or malignant, and they're generally associated with asbestos. Um, there were a lot of people when I was on the pit at Ground Zero many years ago with 9-11, um, we had many people that developed uh, mesothelioma. Um, as a result of inhaling all of the asbestos, because many of the buildings in the city way back then had asbestos, as many homes built in the uh, early 60s and 70s also built with asbestos, and many schools also built with asbestos. And uh, over the last many years, they've been removing it very, very carefully. But when you have that mesothelioma, it replaces the normal healthy tissue. 
and you start to see here all this dead tissue as a result. This becomes the only functional part and it starts pushing inward, making it non-functional. Here's your healthy lung, here's your diseased mesothelioma lung. Okay, it damages that, that pleura. Again, just showing the difference. Here is the, right here, the visceral pleura, and here's the parietal pleura. And here's the pleural space right between. This becomes a problem where let's say you have a rib right here and that breaks and breaks inward. You start to get this buildup of air pressure pushing inward, compressing the lungs. They call that a pneumothorax, typically seen with shot wounds or knife wounds or simply fracturing a rib and that rib splintering, hemorrhaging, creating that buildup of atmospheric pressure, pushing inward, collapsing the lung, makes it very, very difficult uh, to breathe. Uh, the top of the lung is called the apex. And then you have the base of the lung. Here is the sternum in the center. This is the manubrium. This is the body of the sternum. And here's the xiphoid process. You have your ribs. You have costal cartilage. And between, you have intercostal muscles. Let's look at some of the fissures here. On the left side, they're simply an oblique fissure separating into a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. On the right-hand side, there's also an oblique fissure separating into a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, but there's also this horizontal fissure which gives the middle lobe only on the right-hand side. The hilum is a region where you have this opening for lymph, for arteries and veins, like the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins going to the lungs. Okay, we covered this when the conducting zone ends at the terminal bronchioles, the respiratory zone begins, and the respiratory zone terminates at the alveoli, which are the air sacs found within the lungs. And there's the picture on the left-hand side showing the respiratory bronchioles, the alveoli, the alveolar ducts, and the ovary alveolar sacs. And what surrounds the alveolar sacs are the pulmonary capillaries, which is where the gas exchange takes place. You can see here the septal type or alveolar type 1 cell and the alveolar type 2. Let me just circle it for you. Here's the type 2 for surfactant production and there's type one for the gas exchange. You can see the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide taking place there. The reason being is the red blood cell, as the blood goes into the lungs, we have something called the Bohr effect. And the Bohr, let's see if I can spell this here, the Bohr effect tells us that when blood enters the lungs, in the lungs, there's more sodium bicarbonate, it's more alkalinic or basic, hemoglobin and oxygen bind. When that red blood cell hits the cell, where you have the mitochondria and you have the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, lots of acids, which is more acidic in relationship to the lungs, in a more acidic environment, hemoglobin releases the oxygen and you get the release and that oxygen goes into the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation or to produce more energy so the Bohr effect um okay let's see what else we have here blood enters let's go just go back here um the respiratory membrane is composed of the type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells there are also macrophages there um, which protect the lungs uh, the epithelial basement membrane underlying the alveolar wall. We know that there's epithelium there. Uh, the capillary basement membrane that's fused to the epithelial membrane. And then there is the capillary endothelium. Blood enters the lungs uh, via the pulmonary arteries and the bronchial arteries. And blood exits the lungs from the pulmonary veins and the bronchial veins. Ventilation, perfusion, coupling, vasoconstriction in response to hypoxia diverts blood from a poorly ventilated area to well-ventilated areas. So vasoconstriction 
due to response to hypoxia. If there's decreased oxygen in one area, you'll get vasoconstriction or a shunting of blood to divert blood to, to the area that's not getting enough oxygen. That's what that is saying. Okay, I think we're gonna have a video here in a second to kind of show these different steps. Let's see here. Um, let's look at step, where are we? Let's go to step one. At rest, when the diaphragm is relaxed, alveolar pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure and there is no airflow. Well, that makes sense. There's gotta be some pressure change or pressure difference. Step two, during inhalation, the diaphragmatic, the diaphragm contracts and the external intercostals contract. The chest cavity expands and the alveolar pressure drops below atmospheric pressure. Air flows into the lungs in response to the pressure gradient and the lung volume expands. During deep inhalation, the scalenes and the SCM muscles expand the chest further, thereby creating a greater drop in alveolar pressure. During exhalation, the diaphragm relaxes and the external intercostals also relax. The chest and lungs recoil. The chest cavity contracts and the alveolar pressure increases above atmospheric pressure. Air flows out of the lungs in response to the pressure gradient and the lung volume decreases. During forced exhalation, the intercostals, the internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles contract, thereby reducing the size of the chest cavity further and creating a greater increase in alveolar pressure. In pulmonary ventilation, air flows between the atmosphere and the alveoli of the lungs because the alternating pressure difference is created by the contraction and relaxation of the respiratory muscles for inhalation and exhalation. The Boyle's Law uh, goes over the pressure. So pressure changes that drive inhalation and exhalation are governed in part by Boyle's Law. The volume of gas varies inversely with its pressure. So if you look here at the pressure on the left-hand side, and you look at how the pressure increases to the right, right? If you look at the volume of the gas, there's certainly more volume to the left. And then as you start to decrease the canister space, the pressure is going to increase significantly. If you look at the muscles on the left compared to the right, the left-hand side of the picture shows the muscles of inhalation. Uh, the diaphragm is a primary one. And then the external intercostals is also a major one. The scalenes and SCM, those are secondary muscles. So when someone's out of breath and they're running, you'll often see the muscles, <gasps> right, of the neck and you see those muscles contracting. On the other hand, you can see the muscles of exhalation, and those are the internal intercostals, internal obliques, external obliques, rectus abdominis. All the other abdominal muscles are basically used for exhaling. The only one that's for inhalation is the external intercostal. All of the other abdominal and trunk muscles are used for exhalation. You can see that the positioning of the ribs alter and change with inhalation and exhalation, right? The ribs can move upward or they can move downward. That's why you see these arrows on the reading left with inhalation, opening up the ribs and on the right hand side, they're dropping down. Okay, I think we went over this already. Uh, other factors that affect pulmonary ventilation, surface tension, uh, inwardly directed force in the alveoli, which must be overcome to expand the lungs during each inspiration. The elastic recoil decreases the size of the alveolar during expiration and compliance, the ease with which the lungs and the thoracic wall can be expanded. The breathing patterns and respiratory movements, uh, eupnea, that's normal breathing, apnea, no breathing, stops, uh, dyspnea, uh, difficulty in breathing, tachmia is increased in the breathing rate, 
see that sometimes with people with anemia or with when they're anxious. Uh, costal breathing is when they're using the ribs. Uh, and diaphragmatic breathing is appropriate breathing, which is the diaphragm moving only. Uh, these are some other uh, terms, uh, coughing, sneezing, sighing, yawning, sobbing, uh, crying, laughing, hip hiccuping. These are all different types of modified breathing movements. Um, so I want you to take some time to kind of review these. Um, you'll probably see this uh, on the exam somehow in, in basic uh, definition, okay? Uh, during external respiration, oxygen will diffuse from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries, and carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction. During internal respiration, oxygen will diffuse from systemic capillaries into the tissue, whereas CO2 moves in the opposite direction. Pretty straightforward. Let's look at gas exchange here. The respiratory system is responsible for the movement of gases involved in cellular metabolism. Oxygen is used up and carbon dioxide is generated during the aerobic breakdown of glucose and other fuel molecules in order to produce ATP. Three important continuous physiological processes are responsible for the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Ventilation moves gases in and out of the lungs. Gas exchange is the movement of gases into and out of the blood. Gas exchange occurs at the lungs and is called external respiration, and at the tissues, which is called internal respiration. Blood gases are transported throughout the body via the bloodstream. The pulmonary circulation transports the blood gases to the lungs, while the systemic circulation carries them to the organs and tissues throughout the body. The direction that a gas moves is dependent on the concentration of that gas. A gas within a compartment exerts a pressure which is proportional to the concentration of that gas. More gas molecules exert a greater pressure. Gas molecules move down their pressure gradient much like solutes move down their concentration gradient. In a mixture, each individual gas exerts a pressure that is proportional to the concentration of that gas within the mixture. This part of the total pressure is called a partial pressure. A gas moves along the part of the pressure gradient determined by its own concentration, not by concentrations of other gases in the mixture. Gas molecules diffuse from regions of higher pressure or higher concentration to regions of lower pressure or lower concentration. At the lungs, gas exchange occurs between the alveolar and blood compartments. This is external respiration. At the systemic tissue cells, gas exchange occurs between the blood and systemic cell compartments. This is internal respiration. The gas exchange between the alveolar spaces in the lungs and the blood and pulmonary capillaries is called external respiration. Ventilation brings air, rich in oxygen, into the lungs and the air spaces in the alveoli. Alveolar air has a higher oxygen concentration and consequently a higher partial pressure of oxygen than the blood entering the lungs. In contrast, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the blood in pulmonary arterioles than in the alveolar compartment. Thus, the blood in the pulmonary capillary compartment has a lower partial pressure of oxygen and a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Diffusion of gases is dependent on the partial pressure of the gases. Oxygen moves from the alveolar spaces into the blood. Thus, blood leaving the lungs and flowing to the rest of the body is well oxygenated. Carbon dioxide moves out of the blood in the capillary compartment into the alveolar air spaces and is removed from the body at the next expiration.
The gas exchange between the systemic blood capillaries and tissue cells is called internal respiration. Blood, high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide, circulates past tissue cells. The blood near the tissues has a high oxygen partial pressure and low carbon dioxide partial pressure. Compared to the blood entering the tissues, partial pressure of oxygen is low and carbon dioxide is high in the tissue compartment. Diffusion of gases is dependent on the partial pressure of the gases. Oxygen moves out of the blood and into the cells. Carbon dioxide moves out of the tissue compartment into the blood and is carried away. Great, that was very informative. Those videos are great because Sometimes it's just very difficult to draw pictures of these, you know, on a one-dimensional or two-dimensional surface. Okay, so this is just a really nice illustration showing us, let's see if we can go back here, a very nice illustration showing us when we look at the heart, in the center and we see that on the right hand side of the heart which is pulmonary circulation it's and on the left hand side we have uh, systemic circulation we have the left hand side that's pumping oxygen to the entire body whereas the other side is carrying deoxygenated blood and we can see in the alveoli where we have that exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen, 1.5% of the oxygen is dissolved in the plasma and 98.5% is carried by hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin, when we look at blood, heme is the iron containing portion and globin is a transport protein and hemoglobin is where we have oxygen and CO2 that's binding to it. Carbon dioxide, 7% of the CO2 is dissolved in plasma. 23% of the CO2 is carried by hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. And then 70% of CO2 is transported as bicarbonate ions. Okay. Let's take a look at the interactions here. The blood is the medium used for gas transport throughout the body. Oxygen is required for metabolic activity of all body cells, but is only available in the lungs. The partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the alveoli than in the blood, so oxygen diffuses into the blood and can be transported to the other parts of the body. At the tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the blood than in the cells. So the oxygen moves into the cells where it promotes aerobic metabolism. Carbon dioxide is generated in cells as a metabolic waste product and accumulates in the tissues. It must be carried to the lungs where it can be removed from the body. Oxygen is picked up in the lungs and transported to the other body tissues in two ways, attached to hemoglobin molecules in red blood cells and as a dissolved gas. Oxygen is not very soluble in water. Because of this, only a very small percent of the oxygen is transported as a dissolved gas. Almost all oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin molecules located in red blood cells. Hemoglobin molecules consist of four polypeptide chains. Each polypeptide chain contains an iron-bearing heme group. An oxygen molecule binds to each iron ion located in each heme group. Hemoglobin that is not bound to oxygen is called deoxyhemoglobin.
Loading or association of oxygen to deoxyhemoglobin forms oxyhemoglobin. The production of oxyhemoglobin can be illustrated through the following reaction. Oxygen binds with deoxyhemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin and hydrogen ions. This equation represents the binding of oxygen to the iron ions in heme groups in hemoglobin molecules. Oxygen association occurs at the lungs. The dissociation of oxygen from oxyhemoglobin can be illustrated through the following reaction. Hydrogen ions bind to oxyhemoglobin to form deoxyhemoglobin and oxygen. This equation represents the unbinding of oxygen from the iron ions in heme groups in hemoglobin molecules. Oxygen dissociation occurs at the tissue cells. The loading and unloading of oxygen to hemoglobin is governed by factors that allow hemoglobin to pick up oxygen in oxygen-rich environments and give up oxygen in regions where it is needed. The more oxygen molecules binding to hemoglobin, the higher its saturation. When all of its oxygen binding sites are filled, hemoglobin is considered to be saturated and is called oxyhemoglobin. Factors that affect the ability of hemoglobin to bind to or release oxygen include partial pressure of oxygen, pH, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, temperature, a chemical called bisphosphoglycerate, or BPG, and hemoglobin type. A key factor influencing the production of oxyhemoglobin is the partial pressure of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen determines the number of oxygen molecules that can bind oxygen loading or dissociate oxygen unloading from hemoglobin. Blood in vessels coming from the lungs is very high in oxygen partial pressure, so saturation is high. This is because oxygen binds to all available sites in hemoglobin and forms oxyhemoglobin. Blood near skeletal muscle cells is very low in oxygen partial pressure, so saturation is low. The higher partial pressure of oxygen bound to oxyhemoglobin causes the oxygen to detach and it is unloaded to the tissues. Oxyhemoglobin saturation is affected by blood pH values. Increased metabolic acids like lactic acid and carbonic acid enhance dissociation of oxyhemoglobin and the unloading of oxygen. This effect is called the Bohr effect. Lowered pH increases the unloading of oxygen from oxyhemoglobin, thereby making oxygen available for actively metabolizing cells. In contrast, elevated pH values increase the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin, thereby lowering the unloading of oxygen to tissue cells. Carbon dioxide can also bind to hemoglobin. The effect of carbon dioxide partial pressure is similar to the effect of pH. During aerobic metabolism, carbon dioxide gas is generated. The carbon dioxide gas is temporarily converted to carbonic acid in red blood cells. The result of increased carbon dioxide gas in the blood is a lowered pH, causing the Bohr effect. Elevated carbon dioxide levels enhance unbinding of oxygen from oxyhemoglobin, thereby making oxygen available for actively metabolizing cells. By contrast, decreased carbon dioxide, as in the alveolar spaces, increases affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and promotes oxygen loading and transport. To a limited degree, changes in temperature affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. The oxygen-carrying ability of hemoglobin is unaffected by normal temperatures. However, near metabolically active cells, blood temperature rises and decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. The increased temperature promotes unloading of oxygen to continue fueling aerobic metabolism.
When temperatures lower, metabolism slows, and the need for oxygen in cells lessens. More oxygen remains bound to the hemoglobin. Red blood cells do not have mitochondria, so they do not undergo aerobic metabolism, using only glycolysis to generate ATP. Bisphosphoglycerate, or BPG, a special product of glycolysis, accumulates in red blood cells in low oxygen situations. The hormones thyroxine, human growth hormone, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and testosterone can increase the production of BPG. The higher the level of BPG in the blood, the more oxygen that is unloaded from the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is picked up at the tissues and carried in the blood to the lungs for disposal in three forms, as bicarbonate ions, as carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin, and as a dissolved gas. A very small percent of carbon dioxide is transported in the plasma as a dissolved gas. A slightly larger percent of the carbon dioxide is transported bound to hemoglobin as carb amino hemoglobin. Carb amino hemoglobin is formed near metabolically active cells and carries carbon dioxide from systemic cells to the lungs. When the blood reaches the lungs, carbon dioxide dissociates from the hemoglobin and diffuses out of the plasma into the alveolar airspace. Most of the carbon dioxide is carried in the form of bicarbonate ions in the plasma. The carbon dioxide in the plasma diffuses into the red blood cell. There it undergoes a chemical reaction catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase and is rapidly converted to bicarbonate ions. As levels of carbon dioxide increase, the production of bicarbonate ions increases. The bicarbonate ion diffuses into the plasma where it is carried to the lungs. In order to maintain electrical balance in the red blood cell, the movement of the negatively charged bicarbonate ions out of the cell is balanced with the movement of negatively charged chloride ions into the cell. This process is called the chloride shift. Carbon dioxide is generated near the alveoli. The carbon dioxide that is produced diffuses into the alveolus for removal from the body. Very informative. Great video. You may want to watch that a second time because there's a lot of information that that, uh, that that delivered. Okay, we're close to the end here. In terms of controlling respiration, a large portion of respiration is controlled in the brainstem in a specific region here called the medulla. And in the medulla, there are cranial nerves, cranial nerves eight through 12. Okay, and a very biggie is cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve that goes to the lungs. But also the pons is involved and the medulla. So the medulla is here, the pons is here. A large portion of it is controlled right from here. Keep in mind, this is why sudden infant death syndrome, sometimes called SIDS or crib death, um, happens from birth because when a baby is crowning and the doctor grabs the baby's head and distracts, the distraction or pulling can stretch out the spinal cord and really damage C3, C4, and C5. And remember, C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. So if they tug and pull on the baby's neck too hard, it can really damage these nerve roots, damaging the diaphragm that affects breathing, or it can certainly subluxate the C1, 
C2 area called the atlanto-axial region. Atlanto for C1, axial for C2. Not only does traction take place, but there's a large degree of rotation of the baby's head, which affects C1. The reason why the rotation takes place is to make sure that the head rotates past the shoulder so the shoulders can shift and are now in alignment with the vaginal canal. Otherwise, the shoulders hit the pelvic brim and get stuck. So they want to rotate that. And that rotation can certainly do damage to the medullary center, to the medulla oblongata. It can affect the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Again, all contained within the medulla oblongata. And a doc, Dr. Gottfried Gutmann did research in Germany, autopsied 1,500 babies that died of sudden infant death syndrome or crib death, and through these uh, dissections or autopsies discovered that all 1,500 had atlantoaxial instability, meaning there was some sort of degree of subluxation or nerve interference affecting the pathways that regulated and controlled breathing. Let's look at this. So here's the pneumotaxic center. Here's the apneuistic. Again, the pneumotaxic and apneuistic are in the pons. And then the medullary rhythmicity center, you have the inspiratory and expiratory area. Here's the medulla, here's the pons, here's the medulla. The respiratory control center determines the basic rhythmic breathing pattern. Ventilation rate can be altered by other factors, including your emotions, right? If you're anxious, that's going to increase it. Uh, voluntary control from the cerebral cortex, blood gases and pH levels, and of course, exercise. So here's the dorsal respiratory group on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see at, it's active for about two seconds and inactive for three. Um, the diaphragm contracts and the ex external intercostal muscles contract during their most active phase, and that's going to create normal, quiet inhalation. When it's inactive for three seconds, the diaphragm relaxes. The external intercostal muscles become less active and relax, followed by the elastic recoil, and that's normal, quiet exhalation. Now, on the right-hand side, you can have forceful breathing. We have forceful inhalation and forceful exhalation. So you can see the dorsal respiratory group, the DRG, also activates the VRG. So you have the dorsal respiratory group, the diaphragm contracts, and the external intercostal muscles contract during their most active phase, which is what we saw, but also the VRG for forceful inhalation, the accessory muscles of inhalation, the SCM, the scalenes, the pec minor, all contract, creating forceful inhalation. And then the VRG respiratory group for forceful exhalation, the accessory muscles of exhalation, internal intercostals, external oblique, internal obliques, transverse abdominis, and rectus abdominis contract, creating forceful exhalation. Uh, the cortical influences, they allow uh, conscious control of respiration that may be needed to avoid inhaling noxious gases or water, right? So that's you saying, oh, I got to hold my nose. There's diesel fuel coming out of that bus or, oh, the landscapers just, you know, kicked up a bunch of dirt. Let me hold my breath, or holding your breath to go underwater. That's cortically influenced and consciously controlled. Uh, chemoreceptors, the central and peripheral chemoreceptors, monitor levels of oxygen and CO2, and that provides input to the respiratory center as well. Let's look at the regulation of ventilation. Normal ventilation is rhythmic and involves continuous cycles of inspiration and expiration. Various regions of the brain closely regulate this rhythmic pattern of ventilation.
The rhythmicity area in the medulla regulates the basic rhythm of ventilation. The medullary rhythmicity area contains two smaller regions, the inspiratory area and the expiratory area. During normal, quiet ventilation, only the inspiratory area is active, but during forced ventilation, both areas are active. Airflow within the respiratory system can be monitored by a spirogram. Normal inspiration is initiated when impulses from the inspiratory region stimulate inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm, and external intercostals to contract. Contraction of these muscles moves air into the lungs. After about two seconds, impulses from the inspiratory area to the inspiratory muscles cease and the muscles relax. For the next three seconds, Inspiratory muscles are not stimulated, so passive elastic recoil produces expiration. Air moves out of the lungs. After three seconds of relaxation, the inspiratory area again stimulates the inspiratory muscles to contract. And a new ventilation cycle begins. Thus, the inspiratory area controls normal ventilation while expiration is passive. In forced breathing, the inspiratory area sends impulses to accessory inspiratory muscles, resulting in a more forceful inspiration. The inspiration area also activates the expiratory area during the expiration portion of the cycle. The expiratory area then sends impulses to expiration muscles, which consist of internal intercostals and abdominal muscles. These impulses cause the expiration muscles to contract, and this results in a forceful expiration. The rate of the ventilation can also be modified by input from other areas of the brain. Two areas in the pons can modify the rate of ventilation. The pneumotaxic area can inhibit the medullary rhythmicity area, resulting in shorter inspiration phases. This produces short, rapid breathing. In contrast, the apneustic area stimulates the inspiratory area, which prolongs the inspiration phase. This results in long, deep breaths. The hypothalamus is another region of the brain that influences ventilation rhythm. Emotions, pain, and changes in body temperature activate centers in the hypothalamus. These centers, in turn, stimulate the respiratory centers in the pons and medulla, altering the ventilation rate. Impulses from higher cortical brain centers can bypass the respiratory centers in the pons and medulla and provide us with some limited voluntary control over the muscles of ventilation. This pathway allows us to consciously alter our breathing patterns which is necessary for speech or holding our breath. Changes in blood pH, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and partial pressure of oxygen have profound effects on respiratory rate. Chemoreceptors in the central and peripheral nervous systems closely monitor the hydrogen ion, carbon dioxide, and oxygen levels in blood. Changes in the frequency of impulses from the chemoreceptors affects respiratory rate. When carbon dioxide 
and hydrogen ion levels increase, or oxygen level drops, increased impulses from the chemoreceptors stimulate the inspiratory area in the medullary rhythmicity area. Excitation of the inspiratory area increases respiratory rate. A greater intensity of rate and depth of breathing is known as hyperventilation. Increased respiratory rate removes carbon dioxide, thereby increasing pH, and increases oxygen inflow, returning values to normal. When carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion levels decrease, or oxygen level rises, decreased impulses from the chemoreceptors inhibit the inspiratory area in the medullary rhythmicity area. Inhibition of the inspiratory area decreases respiratory rate. A decreased intensity of rate and depth of breathing is known as hypoventilation. Decreased respiratory rate allows carbon dioxide to accumulate, thereby decreasing pH and decreasing oxygen inflow, promoting a return to normal values. Okay, excellent. Let's look at the structures that control respiration. Okay, so right up here we have the glossopharyngeal cranial nerve. That's cranial nerve uh, 9. Remember, 3, 7, 9, and 10 are parasympathetic. We have chemoreceptors, right? And that's afferent information. So all of that, all of these um, chemoreceptors and the glossopharyngeal nerve is sendering, sending sensory input to the neural system. And then we have efferent information. So we're gonna have the respiratory control center. We have cranial nerve 10, the vagal nerve. We have the sympathetics. We have the intercostal nerves. We have the phrenic nerve. All of these things are controlling um, efferent or motor output to the external intercostals, the lung and the diaphragm. So chemoreceptors, which monitor the blood gas and pH, are going to send sensory signals along the glossopharyngeal and the vagal cranial nerve to the respiratory center. So typically here we've got cranial nerve 9, we have cranial nerve number 10, and we can see that cranial nerve number 10 has both this sensory portion and a motor portion to it. So the respiratory center sends the motor signals along the neurons of the spinal nerve to the striated muscle of the inspiratory of inspiration and expiration and along the neurons of the vagal cranial nerve and the sympathetic thoracic nerves to the smooth muscles regulating the lumen of the diameter of the bronchioles for vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Okay? So control of respiration, again, we can see here, you've got carotid bodies, aortic bodies. These are just sensors or receptors that are checking what's happening with, um, with pH and what's happening with carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. So we're gonna have the cranial nerve nine and 10 involved with that. Hypercapnia, that's gonna be a slight increase in CO2. It's going to stimulate the central chemoreceptors, and hypoxia is now oxygen deficiency at the uh, tissue level. Let's look at the role of respiratory system in pH regulation. Many chemical substances in body fluids dissociate and give rise to free hydrogen ions. The pH scale is used to measure the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. The normal blood pH values 
vary around 7.4. When hydrogen ion concentration increases, the pH value decreases, resulting in a state of acidosis. Conversely, when hydrogen ion concentration decreases, the pH value increases, resulting in a state of alkalosis. Life-sustaining chemical reactions are catalyzed by enzymes which can only function effectively within narrow pH ranges. Since blood flow redistributes fluids with different pH in the various body compartments, blood pH regulation is essential to the maintenance of homeostasis. Blood pH is regulated in three ways. Chemical buffers, the respiratory system, and the urinary system. All these methods may decrease or increase the pH value. The respiratory system can regulate blood pH by controlling the amount of carbon dioxide removed from the blood. Near systemic cells, carbon dioxide forms bicarbonate ions in the blood. Hydrogen ions are also released. This decreases blood pH. At the alveolar capillaries, Bicarbonate ions are converted back to carbon dioxide gas, which diffuses out into the alveolus. A reduction of carbon dioxide in the blood reduces hydrogen ion production. This increases blood pH. Altered ventilation rates change the blood concentrations of carbon dioxide and pH. When blood carbon dioxide level is low, and blood pH is high, the respiratory center decreases ventilation rate. Less carbon dioxide is removed from the blood and blood pH goes down. When blood carbon dioxide level is high and blood pH is low, the respiratory center increases ventilation rate. More carbon dioxide is removed from the blood and blood pH goes up. Okay. Okay, so this information was already controlled by that, uh, reviewed by that little video there. Again, these are different types of stimulus that affect the breathing rate and, uh, and depth things like increased body temperature, increased pain, uh, decrease in blood pressure, uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen levels all have a major effect on uh, stimuluses that can uh, increase the rate and depth. And also, if you look on the right-hand side, stimuluses that decrease. So if we're looking at prolonged pain, people that are hurting, their breathing rate and rhythm and depth is going to be uh, increased. But if someone has severe pain, really severe, that can cause apnea. That can increase uh, blood pressure. Okay. Uh, the respiratory and cardiovascular systems make adjustments in response to both intensity and duration. Uh, of exercise, as cardiac output rises, the blood flow to the lungs, termed pulmonary perfusion, increases, and the oxygen diffusing capacity may increase threefold during maximal exercise, so there's a greater surface area available for oxygen diffusion. That just makes sense because, you know, the amount of energy increase at the muscle level is going to go up, so you have Krebs cycle that's going to increase, mitochondrial function is going to increase, so oxygen is going to increase. Um, development of the respiratory system, we can pass, we can pass through that. Um, aging, 
is going to result in decreased vital capacity, blood oxygen level typically decreases, macrophage, macrophage activity decreases, ciliary action of the respiratory epithelium is going to decrease, meaning that the elderly are certainly more susceptible to pneumonia, bronchitis, emphysema, and other issues. Really nice illustration here. Make sure you take a look at the connection between the respiratory system and all the other systems. How is it linked to the muscular system, the neural system, endocrine, cardiovascular, lymphatic, digestive, urinary, and reproductive? This is really the holistic uh, perspective, right? So you wanna be able to take some time and understand these interconnections. So if we look at um, the endocrine system, well, you've got ACE, you got the angiotensin converting enzyme. Remember, ACE is the angiotensin converting enzyme that's needed to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 that's going to increase pressure. If you look at the urinary system, together with respiratory, the urinary system regulates pH depending on how much hydrogens it's going to be eliminating from the body. Um, if we look at the lymphatics, right, you've got the hair in the nose, the cilia, the mucus, all of that being uh, protective. You've got the tonsils, you've got lymphatic tonsils. Um, if we look at the digestive tract, forceful contraction of respiration muscles can assist in defecation that's involved with the Valsalvis maneuver. So really important concept here. Make sure you're familiar with the link between the respiratory system and all other systems. Okay, and that brings respiration to a close.